Hello Rowers, this is Travis, back uh, for another conversation. This one is going to follow up directly on my last video that I published where I was talking about a critical error that athletes and coaches made in terms of structuring their sessions that were meant for race preparation specifically. All right, So we're talking about logging meters, miles at race pace. And in this video, I want to take that a little bit further and dive a bit more into the specifics because in a lot of my videos, I am talking about kind of ideas and subjects and um, kind of a more of a theoretical side of approach to training and not so much of applied. And there's really a reason for that. Uh, I am a huge, huge advocate for individualization of training. Um, I really don't think there's kind of cookie cutter training programs that you can apply across a broad population. I think that it's really important to know and understand the background that an athlete is coming from, both in their training history, their technical skill level, as well as uh, their other time commitments if they're not kind of a student where they can really dive into their training. Um, family stressors, all those things play into what somebody should be doing for the training. And so I really try to avoid giving specific workouts or training advice um, that you know, people that might not be the target population might grasp and might take those and use it, use it improperly. But um, by its very nature uh, for this particular discussion in the, in the race preparation training, um, it actually has a degree of flexibility that allows me to be a lot more specific or at least as specific as I need to be to give you guys the info you need to set up this, this training program. So we talked in that last video and I'll link that kind of in whatever one of these corners that white box pops up in. So you can check that out if you haven't already and you're interested in kind of the ideas behind these training sessions and why you're taking this particular approach. Uh, the main takeaway from that was that if you're training for racing, it's very, very important to spend uh, as much volume as you can at or slightly faster than race pace so that your body is getting used to moving with the quickness that it's going to need in a race situation and that you're not simply just accumulating a lot of lactic acid. Um, without spending time at that specific speed. And so you can use more volume or less reps and go at a speed that's slightly f slower than your race pace, but that is not gonna get your, your legs, in the case of rowing, um, or most other sports are gonna use your legs, um, are not gonna get your legs used to the kind of speed and quickness that you're gonna need at race cadence. And if you're rowing, uh, especially if you're an on the water rower, that quickness is important because you need to basically connect to the water, which is a moving, which is a fluid, and it is in motion relative to you. So you need to connect to something that is moving in order to propel yourself forward, and that requires a good degree of quickness and precision. But let's dive into kind of the nitty gritty. And so for the training sessions, we were talking about quality. And so, you know, a favor of mine, and let's kind of talk about 2000 meter racing. And there was a good question on my last comment um, by an athlete who holds world records on the indoor rower for short sprint distances, so 100 meters, one minute, and the 500 meters, I think. Um, and he was asking, does this apply for those short distances as well? And the, that was an awesome question. And, and the answer to that is that this conversation is really talking about my expertise, my, my focus, which is middle distance. So that's going to be the traditional racing distances for rowing, 1500, 2000 meters, and even down to 1000 meters. And when you're getting beyond that, um, a lot of these principles will still apply, um, but there's going to be more caveats than what I'm going to talk about in this particular video, in this particular conversation. Now going down maybe into the 500 meter, a lot of these are going to apply with very few caveats, but once you start getting down to one minute, Definitely once you're at 100 meters, and if you're pushing in the other direction up to 5K, three miles, um, 6,000 meters, then um, there's gonna be a lot of caveats, all right? There's, so there's gonna be a lot of things that you're gonna do different. But 2,000 meters, all right? So let's talk about 2,000 meters and preparing for racing at a 2,000 meter distance. And so you're gonna be wanting to spend the majority of your in a general base building training phase, especially if you're only peaking once during that year. 
um, then you're probably going to want to spend at least nine months in a base building phase. And that if you're doing a two base building or a two peak season where you're peaking maybe in the fall and the spring, um, then you're hopefully spending it at least about five to six months, uh, maybe even seven if you can really push it in a base building phase. And the rest of that is is that preparation for competition. So when you're getting about four to eight weeks from your target racing, that's when you're gonna wanna start incorporating these training sessions that are targeted very specifically to your race pace. Outside of that, so before that four to eight week period, then you're gonna be wanting to use anaerobic training um, called oxygen transport that is very similar to these sessions and these sessions are a subcategory of oxygen transport and so I would say call it oxygen transport one and the majority of oxygen transport you're using through the year is oxygen transport two those are going to be a little bit more volume uh, they're going to be at a cadence that is lower than your race cadence if you're a rower um, and you use cadence a lot to, to dictate speed. It's still going to be at a very high pressure per stroke, um, but it is uh, going to be at a, a speed that's slower than race pace because your stroke rate is lower than race pace. But for these transport one, um, if you use in a category one to category six system, it's going to be category two training uh, for this. And so it's going to be repetitions at race speed. And the duration of those repetitions don't really matter that much in a specific sense. For me personally, I generally like to keep them in the 600 to 1200 range and I rarely, rarely would ever go above 1000 meters unless I'm doing lots of different distances, in which case I might do 600, 1000, 1200, 1600, something like that. Um, for me, I try not to get too crazy with setting my distances for workouts because I don't need that variety mentally to kind of stay engaged. So I can sit there, I can do all 600 meters for a workout, I can do all 800 meters for a workout, I can do all 1,000 meters for a workout, um, and that's fine with me. Um, and Because the main goal is that I'm spending time at that race pace. And so what's important is gonna be the total volume. So for this workout, I talked in that last video that you want about one and a half to two and a half times your race distance and volume. And I'm rarely gonna get over the two times race distance. Maybe if you're a uh, very high performance athlete and you recover very quickly and you can maintain quality for that duration of repetitions, then you can go ahead and push into that two and a half times. But usually I'm staying within the one and a half to two times of race distance. So if I'm training for 2000 meters, that's 3000 to uh, 4,000 meters of volume. And I'm even for the majority of my coaching has been with youth athletes. So these are athletes within the first couple of years of their training. And I've also worked with a lot of master's athletes um, and the master's athletes I've been working with are not uh, former collegiate athletes that are coming back into, into rowing or have continued uh, to the point where they're masters. These are masters athletes that are picking up the sport later in life in their 30s, 40s, 50s, maybe even later. Um, and they're really getting into training the first, first time. And so their limitations are gonna be very similar um, in a volume sense, maybe even more so because they have age to continue with um, as a youth athlete. So for those groups, so for those younger youth athletes, certain for a novice athlete or for an athlete that's maybe only in their first or second year of varsity rowing, um, then I'm also okay just doing one times race distance for this. And so if they're getting ready for 2,000 meters, I'm okay with them doing two by two that are two by 1,000 meters um, or you know, three by 800 meters, four by 600 meters, keeping it really close to that 2000 meter, that one times race distance um, volume for those athletes, as long as they're getting quality, all right? As long as they're spending time at that race pace. And so that going back to that 1000 meter, so if we're using a 1000 meter as an example, um, I would do either two to three, usually 1,000 meter repetitions with my youth athletes, and there would be an option for a fourth for a very experienced athletes, um, and they would be targeting their their target race pace, maybe a second to a second and a half faster. But your goal really isn't to go a lot faster than race pace because you're feeling good. 
if you're feeling good, then you want to get more volume at that race pace. And so rather than saying, okay, well, we're going to do 1000 meter reps. I want you to do at least two and you can ideally do three. And if you can do four, awesome. So our goal is to spin that volume at that race pace. And it's going to be more beneficial to us to get three or four reps of that thousand meters in um, at race pace or within minus one half or minus one second of race pace than to only get two reps of 1000 meters in going at uh, two or three seconds faster than race pace. All right. So hopefully, hopefully you're following that idea. So we're accumulating volume. Um, if you want to go fast, like if you want to go way faster than race pace, that is not this race preparation training. That is a lactate tolerance training or a lactate production and removal training. Those are your really fast 500 meter pieces or maybe a minute on minute off piece. Um, and those are generally going to be many, many seconds beyond race pace. All right. So anywhere from maybe six to 10 seconds faster than your 2000 meter race pace and then you can extrapolate uh, how much faster it would be the, from 1500 or 1000 meters uh, from that. But that's a different training session and so if you're hit starting to do this workout and you're three seconds faster than your target race pace, then you're hitting that gray zone where you're not, where you're not getting any extra benefit for that race pace training and you're not going fast enough to get that lactate tolerance or that lactate production and removal benefit, all right? All right, so we wanna stay out of that gray zone, all right? So you wanna get repetitions in, you wanna get as much volume as you can at this race pace or very slightly faster. And I say very slightly faster because you never really know how fast you're gonna be between uh, testing sessions, unless you're testing a lot. And I'm also a big advocate of not testing a lot, all right? So I, I think testing two or three times a year is plenty. Um, I am in the vast minority in terms of that sense, but I've also sent dozens and dozens of athletes to very high level collegiate programs. And so, um, you know, it works both ways, all right? And so you can test a lot, you can test a little. For me, testing seemed to be more like a crutch for coaches who couldn't uh, determine how fast their athletes were relative to each other. Um, maybe to give them a little credit, if you're working with a lot more athletes than I was, so I was usually working with two to three eights. If someone's working with five or six eights of youth athletes, then maybe you need to test them a little bit more to kind of see where they fall in the pecking order. Um, because the difference between second and third boat is a lot smaller than it would be for me. But I still don't think that. I still want to test my athletes more than two or three times a year. Um, I think that's, you know, hopefully if you're watching them every single day and you're following their training, you have a pretty good idea how fast they're going. But I'm getting off on a tangent. So back to the focus. All right. So 1,000 meters at or slightly faster than race pace. We're giving it slightly faster than race pace. Just to give you a little buffer in case you are physically capable of going a little faster than you might think at any given time. Um, and going a half second or set one second faster shouldn't really impact the amount of repetitions you're going to be able to achieve on that workout. All right. And so if you go, it might make that last, uh, half of that last interval a little bit more difficult. If you went a second faster than your target, then, then uh, zero seconds faster. But if you're going two, three seconds faster at that kind of high end speed, then that might limit your ability to finish that last interval. So, um, going back then to the duration of those intervals. And so I was using a thousand meters. I use a thousand meters a lot with my athletes. Um, it doesn't have to be a thousand meters as an athlete myself. Um, I would use 600 meter repetitions a lot. I use 800 meter repetitions a lot. Um, and I would just repeat those until I got to the feeling that I needed to get to. Now this gets to the next step in this workout is that your goal is not to, um, again, achieve a set predetermined amount of intervals. All right. Your goal is to get your body in a certain degree of oxygen debt and then stop the workout and then recover. And so, our sport is really focused on this idea of toughness and not quitting. And I really feel like, well, one, surely being tough is important, especially in, in, a, in a racing sport where you're going up against your other athletes and you're competing not only on a physical sense, but on a mental sense. But um, there's, there's a difference between being tough and kind of training smart. And I think 90% uh, of people in the sport kind of go leave that training smart aspect to try to prove that they're tough and to not quit. Um, but with this particular training session, if I were setting this up for myself, 
Um, this training session would actually not have a predetermined number of reps. Um, it would be complete reps until you get to this specific feeling. And for me, that feeling is, is this kind of what people might call the wall. All right, so when you're in a high lactate concentration in a race, and then there's a moment where you're like, whoa, you just got this flood of extra lactic acid. Your, your legs feel like you really, you hit that wall. You feel very different. Um, it feels a lot harder. It doesn't necessarily impact your ability to continue at that pace, but there's a difference. There's an inflection point there in your lactic acid. All right, for me, it's really, it's like a wave of lactate kind of pain that hits me. And if I've timed it right, hopefully that happens in the last maybe three to 400 meters, all right, of my race. If I haven't paced it right, it's gonna happen before, and that's, that's no fun, all right? And if I haven't paced it right, then it's not gonna happen till the end, or it's not gonna happen at all, in which case you held back a little bit too much. But that feeling, that kind of overwhelming lactic concentration, that's a feeling that I really think you should only push through in a race situation, all right? And so that is, you're doing severe damage to your to your system with that lactic acid, all right? And if you're pushing beyond that, you're gonna take a long time to recover, all right? And there's a reason we take a couple days to recover after championship level races, because we're doing a lot of damage to our body. In training, I don't think you should do that. I think that you're getting enough of an anaerobic training effect just coming up to that threshold to where you hit that wave and then being like, okay, we're done. I'm not gonna make that, that superhuman effort to kind of push past. And so if I'm going out and I'm doing 600 meter repetitions, I'm doing them at my race speed. I'm also doing them at or maybe slightly below my race cadence, all right? by slightly below, I'm saying like maybe one, maybe two strokes per minute, all right? And that's just trying, that's basically saying I'm gonna be hitting my race pace slightly slower than race cadence to give a little bit of overstimulation to that power per stroke, all right? But I'm gonna be doing those reps and I'm gonna have an open rest interval, all right? So as I talked about in my last video, that rest interval is however much you need in order to repeat that effort. If you're less fit, less experienced, um, then that's gonna take more time. Uh, if you are a highly fit athlete, then it's going to take less time. And hopefully, uh, if you're a highly fit athlete, you have enough experience that you're going to be able to, to uh, be honest with yourself and know the difference between, uh, I'd really rather not do this again versus, okay, my body is ready to do it again. Let's, let's dive into this work. Um, so I would... I'll do my 600 meters, I'll rest until I feel like I can do it again, I'll repeat that until I hit that kind of that wave of lactic acid during one of my reps, and then that's my last rep. Then I do my active recovery, and I row home after that, and that's the end of the workout. And for me, that would usually fall somewhere within that three to 4,000 meters of total volume for that session. Um, and that was me when I was training and winning um, senior level and intermediate level national championships, all right? So whatever level that puts me in the grand scheme of from elite to maybe a high performing high school athlete. Um, now, I was a very experienced athlete, all right? And I had already been doing all the research that kind of laid the foundation for the knowledge that's allowing me to give you these talks. And I've also, as, as a higher level athlete, I had also developed a really good sense of feel, of a feel for my own body and, and when I kind of got to certain points that I needed to in my training and it was okay to back off. And there was a maturity there and knowing the difference between I'm stopping this workout because I've achieved my goal versus I'm stopping this workout because it's really hard and I don't want to be doing this. And I kind of just want to sit on the couch and watch TV. All right. Now, I've quit plenty of times in workouts for that latter part, for that this is hard, I don't really want to do this anymore, especially after I retired. I mean, it didn't happen too much when I was actually training for high competitive goals, but certainly when I've been training just for the fun of it, there's plenty of times where I'll get into a workout and I'm like, eh, I'm done, I don't want to do this anymore. So, but you, if you're gonna leave this completely open, then you gotta have the maturity and the, the wherewithal to be able to be honest with yourself and, and when you're making that call. And that's hard. As a coach, um, I never did that with my youth athletes, all right? So I always gave them a, a goal number of reps that I wanted them to achieve. And I expected them to do that, to the, that number of reps. 
and then I would kind of give them guidance in terms of how many I wanted them to push beyond that minimum. And I also set criteria to allow them to push beyond that minimum or not. All right, we talked before, we're accumulating volume at race pace. So if I have an athlete and we're doing 600 meter reps and I say, I want you to be doing, I want you to do at least four of these and as many as, let's say seven of these, then they weren't allowed to do number five if number four was slower than their target race pace and certainly slower than three. Um, and, and I kind of use that as, as a carrot. And so people were only allowed to do more volume if they were, if they were maintaining their speed or negative splitting slightly on these workouts. All right. So, I mean, if they went maybe half a second slower on their fourth one than the third one, then I'd say, okay, we need to make sure that we maintain that pace. You can do your fifth one. And if they stuck that pace on their fifth one, then they can do the sixth one if they uh, felt like they hadn't hit that, that wave of lactate, that wall yet. Um, and then for the rest interval, I would definitely be more stringent for that rest interval for those youth athletes because um, 90, at least 80% probably 90% of the youth athletes that you're going to coach, unless you're in a, a high performance program, they're not super mentally tough athletes. All right. You know, they're kind of maybe above average, you know, most of them are going to be average or below in terms of mental toughness. And they're going to have that desire to just take more rest and avoid the pain and discomfort of that session. Um, and they're not going to have the maturity to kind of just, you know, suck it up and be like, all right, it's time to get on with that interval. So with those youth athletes, if you truly say, take as much rest as you need until you're ready to do the next interval, the vast majority of people are going to be wandering around for 20 minutes if you let them and you don't want that to happen. All right. And so, um, generally I would say, um, you know, if you're doing 600 meters, then the amount of time it takes you to very slowly paddle a thousand meters is more than enough to get you ready for the next interval. So I would kind of use my best judgment as a coach to kind of make sure people were getting back on. But one thing I want to do is I want to say we're all doing, we're all doing 600 meter intervals and we're all doing eight minute or 10 minute rest. And we're all starting at the same time. Um, that might be good for some kind of unity, but you know, hopefully you get unity other ways in your coaching and that uh, you can say the athletes are all right as long as they know all their teammates are getting in the intervals. They're all right if somebody is starting their fifth interval um, and they've still got three or four minutes of rest left. It's no big deal. And so I would kind of be there to say, all right, you have an open rest interval, finish your 600 meters, paddle until you're ready for the next one. And I'd also be watching, and if I saw someone lollygagging or taking a little bit too much, I'd be like, all right, it's time to get back on, let's do the next interval. And so that's how I applied this concept for less experienced athletes or less skilled athletes, or less talented athletes. Um, and so there is a little bit of structure, but I wanted to keep as much flexibility as possible. And so that's that, all right? So that's kind of how I set up these, these workouts. Um, you're welcome to, if you don't wanna just do a bunch of 600 meter intervals or a bunch of 800 meter intervals, a bunch of 1000 meter intervals, do 600 meters, then 800 meters, then 1000 meters, then 800 meters, then 600 meters. And you're still taking as much rest as you want after each interval before you're ready to go on to the next interval. All that matters is that you're getting your body, um, you're putting in enough repetitions to get your body to that, to that inflection point of lactic acid where you're feeling yourself shift into, I need, I would need to have a race quality effort to continue holding this pace. Um, get to that point, stop the workout and then move on. And don't be afraid to go into a workout and say, you know, I'm going to do 600, 800,000, 800, 600, hit that point that lactic acid point with 600 meter or with 200 meters to go in that second 800 meter piece, finish that piece and then call the workout. Be all right stepping away from that last 600 meter piece. Don't feel like you're quitting on the workout by doing so. All right, and that's the takeaway. So this I suspect went on a lot longer than I thought, I actually thought it would be a short one, but there's a lot of considerations to getting a good training session. And hopefully you guys got some good information out of this. You're armed with the knowledge that you need to do your 
uh, race preparation sessions. Uh, remember, you're, you're starting these about four to eight weeks out from your target competitions. Um, the total volume that you're doing is probably between one and two and a half times uh, race distance. Uh, one times race distance, really only for less experienced athletes, maybe within the first one to three years of your career. Um, and then that one and a half to two and a half times your race volume for more experienced athletes. Your goal is to accumulate volume at race speed, um, maybe slightly faster, but not a lot faster, especially if going a lot faster is going to uh, decrease the amount of volume you're gonna be able to get in for that particular session. Your rest is however much rest you need in order to be able to come back and create uh, another quality session. You gotta be honest with yourself. Don't take rest just because you're trying to avoid the hard work. Take the rest because you feel like you need it to be fresh enough to be able to go back and repeat that effort. Um, if you're doing a thousand meters, um, I generally find that rest to be somewhere within the 11 to 14, 15 minute range, all right? And try to keep at least half of that active. And then you can kind of extrapolate how much rest approximately you might need for 600, 800 meters based on that. Um, and then you're targeting maybe at your race cadence, maybe slightly below to induce a little bit of extra power per stroke. By slightly below, I'm talking about one to maybe two strokes below your target race cadence. And then you're doing these repetitions until you get that, that kind of feeling of hitting the wall that you hit in a race where it starts to take unique effort, race reserved effort in order to get to that finish line, all right? Don't go into that level of effort in your training, all right? Save that for your top end racing. And uh, that's it. So if you have questions, comments, put them down below in the comments section. Uh, like this video if it helped you. Subscribe if you've come here for the first time and you like the content and you wanna get more of it. Uh, if you hit that bell notification after you subscribe, then you'll get an email every time uh, I post a new video. But uh, that's it. Thanks a lot for listening, guys. I'm hoping this is helping you. Hopefully we all get back on the water soon um, and social distancing gets eased and you can actually put this into play. But that's it. Uh, Travis signing off. Peace.